Welcome to School of the Bible. This is our mini-series that is a mini-Bible series where we take 15 minutes and 15 verses from the scriptures, from the Bible, and encapsulate, encompass, involve you in that with which God is going to do in your life with these 15 minutes or 15 verses that he can cause you to think upon, to ponder, to remember, and to go forward with at least some part of the scriptures in your life that you'll remember and use for your life today. We call this Deuteronomy 15.15 because it is 15 minutes with 15 verses. And so we read, as we're reading in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, These be the words which Moses spoke unto all Israel on this side, Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizabab. They are eleven days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir unto Kardesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the fortieth year, in the eleventh month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke unto the children of Israel, according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. After he had slain Zihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, which dwelt at Astaroth in Edrei. On this side, Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare the law, saying, The Lord your God spoke unto us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough in this mount. Turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites, and unto all the places nigh thereunto in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. And I spoke unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, you are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as you are, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? Take you wise men and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And you answered me and said, the thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. And so it is that we begin our study in recognizing that not only has God brought the children of Israel to a place of blessing, but they have grown and developed. They have gotten larger and bigger and bolder and more in number than even the stars in the sky. Or so it seemed to Moses, maybe to you and I, living in our 7 billion, almost 8 billion people on earth. It may not seem as though they were the stars in the heavens, but when you look down, as Moses must have done, from the hilltops surrounding or at least nearby the children of Israel camped out on the plain, then you would have seen every man having his own household and every household having their own campfire and every campfire cooking their own food that they needed and they required for the sustenance of the day. Now, when you look out over maybe six million, as we assume that started with, and then now have grown even more so, a lot of people like that with campfires, it's a pretty impressive sight. It's amazing to see what God can do when he causes people to dwell in peace and then causes them to conquer in the name of the Lord. Now, this is what Moses is trying to remind the people of what God has done. And then what Moses has done, even as he is starting to tell them about, hey, look, 
These are the people that you set in charge. I was the one God chose, but now I have chosen to set others, in fact, able to decide for you the things that you need to do in order to solve your strifes, your problems, your circumstances, your issues. And these wise men would be men that you choose to rule over you, to have, as it were, decision-making process over you. We sometimes look at that today and we call it, well, that's like representatives or the House of Representatives or the Senate. Well, no, it's not. Because, you see, it wasn't just someone that was voted for popularity's sake. It was someone that was wise and had to be approved even by Moses. It was the captains of fifties, the captains of tens. And as a matter of fact, it gets real interesting when you talk about representation because it goes officers among your tribes that would be even captains over ten. Ten people. We call it a minion in Hebrew, but ten people. Imagine that. Someone who represents you that you could talk to that was ten families gathered together. And that would be a representative over them. Now, I kind of find that interesting that God was so concerned about his people that he would allow that to be a part of the governance of God. How God would take care of his people, not how man does. We look at our Senate today and we say, hey, you know, our House of Representatives represents us. Really? How closely are you in touch with your House of Representatives? Well, I'm a phone call away. I'm an email away. So when's the last time you talked to him personally? In other words, most of the people that are represented in a district do not have direct representation by giving to a person their grievances or their blessings, their understandings, or someone who is over you, ten families wise, your perspective. I kind of look at that and say, you know, we ought to go back to that. Now, some people would say, well, we'll never get anything done. Well, you know, maybe that might be true. Maybe not. Maybe if we were that closely represented, then we would have, as it were, someone who knows what we're going through because they are closely associated with us, the ten of us. And then above that, the hundred. I should say the ten and then the, the fifties and then the hundreds and then the thousands. So, it's interesting that that's regulated like an army because you have your battalions and your companies and your, as we go down the ladder of you know, organization with it, those types of platoons and, and assemblies of men that are sent out in order to wage war. Likewise, would it not be wise to do so in our own governance in some ways? I think so. I think today that a lot of times what we have when we're disgusted or frustrated or aggravated at the government is because we don't have that direct representation. But the thing that I find really interesting in this is that the Lord spoke unto them in Horeb and were given a very interesting description. In other words, there are people today that want to tell us that God doesn't do miracles back then and he didn't go through the Red Sea and they didn't walk on dry land. They went through the Reed Sea, someplace else. And yet we're given a very physical, very accurate description of where and what God did when he was talking about moving the children of Israel. You'll find that interesting because it's an exact, detailed description. You find that happening throughout Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy for a simple, particular reason. It's an integral specificity that means that it's specific to the place with which it was located, and it has instructions that are to guide the person specifically, not generally and not vaguely and not in some way that can be interpreted or applied in any other way except for how specific it is. It is detailed. God knows exactly where you are. And that's what we want to get out of these first 15 verses is not only does God accurately represent you because he is personal to you now more so than they were with the children of Israel with only representation of 10 families, you being the head of your own household. But God today is specific to you personally one to one. So it's not a one to 10 and then the 10 to 50 and then the 50 to 1,000 and 1,000 to larger, but rather it is individually. Each and every one of us. It's not about a church organization where you have to go to your elders or your deacons or your pastor or your whatever 
except unless you have a problem inside that building or that church organization that you have a problem with the organization, then I can see the point of you going there. But you see, with your religious life, with your life in God, you go one-to-one, -one, God and you. You don't go to me and 10 of my pastors or 10 of my elders or 10 of my neighbors. No, it's you and God one-to-one. -one. And God, so specific in writing this to Deuteronomy, is making it applicable to you and knowing exactly where you are and what you need. Because he is so detailed in explaining it to the children of Israel, reminding them that this is where it happened. This is what happened. This is how it happened. We often have days of remembrance. We call them holidays. Those days where we say, oh, well, the 4th of July, we remember that, hey, back in 1776, the declaration was signed. But how much do you know about it? How little are you informed of it? And do you realize how much division and strife there was in order to get to the place of what they did? There's so much that is written about why it's so perfect, it's really not. Our Constitution is something that has been created by a process of agreement and disagreement, of arguing and debate, of things that didn't work and the things they are trying to make work. And the best that we have is what we have today. And that is not what God is saying here. God is saying, look, this is who I am. I am specific. I am real. I have spoken. I said it. I did it. Your proof is in your life. Your life demonstrates the fact that I am God and you are my people and I have done everything that I have said I would do. And that's what we see in verses 1 through all the way down to, gosh, Down to verse 11, because after that, Moses says, and not only did God do all this, but hey, you got so big, I couldn't handle you. I mean, you know, I was, you know, I, might, I know you love me, but guess what? It got too big for me to handle. So I appointed other people. But verses 1 through 11, the specifics of the majority of what the text is talking about is God knows you. God has your location. God has demonstrated in your life the actual Promises, prosperity, positivity, if you want to get into some crazy idea that you have to be always positive and not negative, well, there's the positivity. The positiveness, but he knows you in the way that he's brought you up unto this day. You can look back in your history and see that God was specific to you. God wasn't vague. God said, this is what I do. This is what you do. You do this. You get sin. You get punished. You get forgiveness. You get mercy. You get grace. And I will forgive you. But you don't do this, you'll go to hell. You do this, you'll be blessed and you'll go to heaven. You'll have a certain amount of prosperity in this life, not riches and wealth and money like some pastors will teach or prosperity doctrines will try to tell you that that's what God wants for you, and it's not. But rather, he said that I will use you as a fountain to go out into the all of the people and that you will be able to pass out the blessings I've given you to them so that you would be a part of what I do, which is to love on people all around you. You would be the artesian wells in your location as you are, where you are, doing what you do, because I want you to bless other people. I want you to help them. I want you to clothe them. I want you to take care of them. I want you to house them. Even the refugee, even the stranger, even the person in your midst that you do not know, I want you to be so. And that's how God is describing the first 14 or 12 verses in Deuteronomy chapters 1 through 15. He is letting you know, as he speaks to the children of Israel, and as he speaks to you, this is what I did. This is what I said. This is how I filled it. This is what I promised. This is how it happened. And this is what you still have yet to do. See, in the end of it, we're, we're shown that the Tigris and Euphrates River was a part of that promise, and it's never been fulfilled. It's never been a place where the children of Israel got a chance to go and expand outward and incorporate all of the land that God gave them. That won't happen until the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom upon the earth. But God reminds him, there is a promise here. I've done my part. You have been prosperous. Go do your part. And that's why we have to recognize for ourselves, God has done his part for what we are called to do. God has said to us in Deuteronomy and in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels, and the great news that we have salvation, that he has provided for us and taken care of us and brought us through struggles, brought us through wars of the flesh, 
wars, sometimes in battlefields, sometimes just wars in our own mind, that we are also likewise the children of Israel in ways that we are being governed by God, not by man. We don't look at Trump and say, hey, there's a godly man, let's follow him. No, there's an ungodly man that's a businessman that is self-centered, selfish, and is serving the God of Mammon. He's serving the God of gods of this world, Satan. And we know that because of what he does and how he does it and how he says and what he says. But what you say should be in accordance with what we're seeing in Deuteronomy. This is where God brought me. This is where God has me. This is where God took me. This is how God did it. This is my testimony. You see, that's what's happening right now, is that we're being given a testimony. We're being given a witness. We're being given a reality of what God has done through the history of the children of Israel going through this time of God revealing himself and then God revealing his purpose and plan through his people as he had chosen Moses to deliver the people and has given them a deliverer and a savior. We're going to see that he's going to leave and God has set up people even after Moses is gone. And so too, when Jesus left us, he's given us people that we can look to, pastors and elders and deacons and apostles and missionaries and all those around us that can encourage us, exhort us and allow us the freedom to choose which day if we will serve the Lord today, tomorrow or never. Whether we would go to heaven or hell, whether we would be found faithful like those at Horeb or at Sinai, following after Moses as the leader of God, being chosen by God to teach of God, to tell us of God, because the children of Israel had been so absorbed by the gods of Egypt that they didn't even have a society. They were setting up a law that dictated how society should exist. It wasn't a law of God. It wasn't a law to be kept forever and ever. It's a law that meant that this is a mentality that we have to have in order to exist as a people, in order to present ourselves to God. And then as we examine it closely, we see that there are criteria that we cannot meet, things that we cannot do, that we fail miserably in being and doing and applying to our lives only after Jesus gives us the explanation of what the law is meant to do when the intent is involved. Because the content, Paul said, as far as the law is concerned, I'm blameless. But as far as what the intent of the law is concerned, I'm guilty. So you see, it is true that you can be legally presentable to God by the law. You can, and you can try it, except for Jesus, who being the lawgiver, says, no, you can do it on the outside, but I'm looking at you on the inside, and man, you are like full of dead man's bones and sepulchers, and you know, you lying to yourself and inventing new rules and regulations. No, you don't keep the law. You fail in every point, because it's a law that meant for the body, soul, and spirit not simply for the flesh. Because according to the flesh on the outside, sure, go ahead, legalist, you can try and live it and be sort of applicable to it. But then when God judges you by it, you'll fail. Because he's going to ask your soul, where were you? Did you love? Not your legalist. So God has demonstrated to us something here that should be applicable to us today. We can remind ourselves every day that, hey, God, look back. Look at what you did. Look at where I am. Look at what I've got. And look how far I've come. That is the message of Deuteronomy. God knows where you are. God knows where you come from. And God knows where you're going. And God knows I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea looking at you, listening to you, or understanding you, where you come from or where you're going. But one thing I can do is I can say, hey, you remind me of Deuteronomy when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. And then one day they had to be reminded that it was God who led them along the way, that it was God who delivered them, that it was God who saved them, that it was God who brought them to the place that they are living, and that it was God who was sending them forth. Even after Moses was leaving the scene, God was still in control.